What's up, Christology students? In this next unit, we're going to start looking at how Jesus' life revealed his mission. So being able to understand the person of Jesus means that we also understand the world that he lived and preached in. So what we're going to do is spend a bit of time here learning about life in Judea along with the social and political undercurrents of the time. So within Judaism, there were a few sects or groups, and it is important to know who they were so that when we are studying the Gospels and these people make an appearance, you will know why Jesus speaks to them the way he does or alludes to them to illustrate a point he wants to make. So let's get started. So Judea, at the time of Jesus' birth, was a Roman province. It came under Roman domination with Pompey's conquest in 63 BC, so that was kind of the end of Jewish leadership or the Hasmonean dynasty. And that's a problem theologically and politically because Israel doesn't become independent again until 1948. And so um, this problem is intensified by the procurators appointed by Rome. Herod the Great, who was ruling from 37 to 4 BC, was named king of the Jews, and he married a woman of Hasmonean stock, mostly probably to legitimize his reign. Uh, then he proceeds to wipe out every one of her family members. Eventually, he has his wife killed and two of his sons as well. So he wasn't very benevolent, wasn't very tolerant. Um, but besides being the ruler at the time of Jesus' birth, he's probably best known for urbanization projects um, and enlarging the temple in Jerusalem, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So at Herod's death, the territory was divided among his three remaining <laughs> sons, the ones he didn't kill, uh, but from AD 6 on, the rule of Judea, Samaria, and Idumea, also called Adam, was by Romans appointed um, by the emperor. So these Roman governors had supreme authority. They could tax you, they could kill you, <laughs> they could let you live, they had control of the police. Um, but honestly, they often left matters to the local courts, as the trial of Jesus shows. So it's important to understand that the Romans basically let the Jews sort of take care of their own issues. So in this picture, we see a model of the temple in Jerusalem that Herod rebuilt and enlarged around 10 BC. This temple does not is not standing now. In fact, all that's left of the temple is the western wall. That is still a very sacred space for Jewish people to go and pray at. So this temple back in Jesus' time really was the center of Jewish life. This is where people would go to um, mark a special occasion in their life, to pray, and to make sacrifices. So it was not only a sacred space where they did believe that God abided here, but it was also a symbol of Jewish unity. So in the next couple of slides, we'll take a look at who are the people that you would have seen hanging out around the temple. So as we begin to study the Gospels, we need to understand who some of these key characters that show up are. And the Pharisees were a group within Judaism who were known as the teachers of the law, they were probably urban, middle class, but they did have the support of the peasantry. So the Pharisees would have been considered progressive in this day and age. They valued the oral interpretation of the Torah, which interpreted and updated the written laws. They also didn't see just the Torah as being the only authoritative um, teachings from God as well. So they also believed in angels and spirits and the resurrection of the just after death. So they were scholars and leaders in the synagogues and rabbinic Judaism, which is the Judaism that survived the destruction of the temple that we just saw in the last slide in around 70 AD is the work of the Pharisees. So these guys have essentially carried on over the course of time. So the Sadducees hung around the temple. They were the upper crust, if you will. They had land. They had a lot of power in the Jewish governing body or the Sanhedrin. They were a priestly class, um, a well-to-do party, and they are known for compromising with Rome to, to preserve their aristocratic status. Theologically speaking, the Sadducees only believed that the first five books of the Old Testament or the Torah were sacred. They rejected the oral tradition that was associated with the Pharisees. So basically, anything a Pharisee would say, a Sadducee would, would be contrary to that. 
It's also important to note that the Sadducees' party did not survive the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Basically, when the temple went, so did their group. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees are kind of these grumpy old men in the Gospels who dedicate a lot of their time trying to trick Jesus and to get him to say something against the law. Speaking of the law, that brings up one more group, the scribes. The scribes were like the lawyers of the time. They were very well versed in the Jewish law. People often appealed to them as someone as an authority who could tell them what the Jewish law says or teaches on a, on a certain matter. So you'll see them come up as well in your reading of the Gospels, oftentimes when people are trying to trick Jesus and get him to say something that would go against the law. So the next group within Judaism that we're going to take a look at are the Essenes. These were known essentially as the monks of Judaism. This group insisted on strict separation from all that was unclean, including Gentiles or non-Jews. The temple, which they believed was not being run correctly by the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the priestly class, and even other Jews. It would take three years to convert to their way of thinking and they were celibate and ascetic, which means they really lived a very strict life. The Romans attacked their large community at Qumran near the Dead Sea and wiped out their whole monastic settlement, and they left for us their library, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you can see here, these are some of the caves that they lived in. The next group we're going to look at are the Zealots. The Zealots probably wouldn't have even existed if Rome hadn't been dominating Judea. They were fierce in their desire for independence. They were absolutely against the Romans leading them. They believed that only God should be leading them. They were willing to die for this, and they probably instigated the rebellion against Rome in AD 66. So any Jew living outside the Holy Land is a Jew of the Diaspora or the Dispersion. The first major wave of Diaspora Judaism was due to the Babylonian invasion of 586 BC, but by the first century AD, more Jews lived outside Judea than actually lived in it. So they were settling in places like Upper Mesopotamia and Babylonia, mostly because of the conquest, while others avoided the conquest by fleeing down into Egypt. The Diaspora Jews were influenced by Hellenistic or Greek culture. Meanwhile, many Gentiles living in close proximity to the Diaspora Jews were attracted to Jewish beliefs. So it was among such Gentile people that St. Paul finds a very fertile mission territory for spreading the word, the gospel. And the last group we're going to take a look at are the Samaritans. Not one of the Jewish groups mentioned before would include the Samaritans as a group or a sect within Judaism. They were detested. Um, they were seen as half-breeds. How did they get to be a half-breed? Well, basically, when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC, many of Israel's citizens were taken into exile, and colonists were brought in from other areas to settle. And these colonists brought their gods with them and intermarried with the Israelites. So these Samaritans, at the time of the New Testament had their own temple on Mount Gerizim, and looked forward to a Messiah like Moses. Their scripture consisted of the Torah with um, some modifications. But it's important to understand how much the Jewish people disliked the Samaritans because Jesus draws on this dislike for a major ironic twist in one of his most famous parables, the story of the Good Samaritan. So that's a quick overview of some of the major people, characters, concepts that we'll encounter as we delve into the Gospels here and start to understand the person and mission of Jesus Christ.